Uh, I think one of the most private thing you have that you don't want to share to people is your bank statement or your credit card statement or whatever it is that you have. Uh, simply because your credit card statement or your bank statement actually says a lot about you. What you choose to spend your money on um, says a lot about your priorities. It's probably one of those things that you don't show to people because it's really, really revealing, isn't it? It tells you where you've been going to or what you've been spending money on. Remember, it's a little bit similar to remember that that time when um, when there was a bit of an outbreak in Sydney before this one, the previous one, where the uh, he was checking in in a lot of Bunnings or barbecue galores, and he was just telling everybody, everyone knows where he was been going. I think our credit card statement is a little bit like that. I don't maybe something similar to our credit card statement is where we've been checking into. It tells you what our priorities are, it tells you what, what you're doing, what's important to you. And you know what? I wonder if we can find out what is important to God. I wonder if we can have an insight into what's important to God. We can't look at God's credit card statement, but maybe we can look at something else. Let's pray and then uh, we'll reflect on the Bible that we, the part of the Bible that we just read together. Please join with me as we pray together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise that uh, you are a God who reveals yourself to us, who tells us uh, what is important to you. And so Father, help us as we reflect on this passage, a really short passage. Um, help us as we keep thinking about generosity uh, from last week, this week, and next week. And we pray, Father Lord, we know that your word has power and it has power to transform. And so we're looking forward and we're expecting that you would do something. Uh, that you would change our hearts, that you would mold us to become more like Christ. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we go through the passage, I think it's really helpful for us if we cast our net just a little bit wider and look at what the Bible says about who we should be generous towards. Remember from last week, we talked about generosity, right? We talked about how generosity actually doesn't come from just us trying to be more generous as we hear God's instruction, just kind of do it. It doesn't come from faking it until we make it. It, it doesn't come from just trying harder. It actually comes from a heart that has been transformed by the gospel. It comes from Jesus changing us uh, because he died for us on the cross. And he gave us new life in the resurrection. And he's giving us the spirit right now to work in us. As we reflect on the word of God, God is doing something in us. Changing our perspective, changing our feeling, changing our desires, changing our concern. And generosity is an overflow of that transformed heart. Generosity comes because we are responding to what Christ has done through the cross and his resurrection. In the gospel, in the message of the good news to Jesus. And I think th this is really central, and I, I want to keep repeating it, because this is what Christianity is all about. Christianity, unlike any other religion, is not about just do your best, and maybe God will like you in the end, or you just have to be A or B or C. Christianity at the very center, at the very core of it, is not what we are doing. It, at the very center of it, it is what Christ had done for us. And what we do is sim a simple response to what he had done. In fact, it is just a simple overflow of the things that he is doing in our hearts even today. So, as we think about generosity, I, I want us to keep thinking about what it looks like. And, and next week, we'll, we'll figure out uh, more about what generosity is all about and what it means to be generous, what it looks like to be generous. But today, um, as we think about how gifts that have been given to the church is administered and how that needs to be administered. I think we, we need to look a little bit further out and, and answer the question first, who should we be generous to? If we're called to be generous, who should we be generous to? And if I can summarize it for you, there are two groups of people that God wants us to be generous towards. The, the first one is the poor. In fact, our passage in 2 Corinthians would fall into this category too because the Christians in Jerusalem who are in need of financial aid they are the one who received this gift that Paul is collecting uh, amongst the 
Christians in Corinth. And in fact, throughout the whole Bible, we see this command from God to be generous to and to look after the poor. So Clara, if you don't mind putting it up on the screen, uh, the slide, I'm going to show you some passages really quickly and just have a quick overview of all the bits where God says, and not all of them, but a bit where God talks about uh, us needing to be generous to those who are disadvantaged in our community. So to the Israelites, for example, who are entering the promised land. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, uh, I'll read to you verse 7. If anyone is poor among you, fellow Israelites, in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted toward them, rather be open-handed and freely lend them whatever they need. There will always be poor in the land. Therefore, I command you to be open-handed toward your fellow Israelites who are poor and needy in your land. This command is given to the Israelites just before they enter the promised land. But, poor, but God warns them, through Moses, God warns them there's going to be poor people there too. And you need to look after them. And this open-handedness, by the way, this generosity, isn't just towards their own countrymen. It's not just towards the Israelites, but it's also to foreigners who happen to be traveling in their land so for example next slide please leviticus 19 verse 10 and you shall not strip your vineyard bare neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourners i am the lord your god this is their version of welfare or social security making sure even the poor would have things to eat So that's in the Old Testament law. We find a God who is concerned for the poor, a God who wants his people to show the same concern. Uh, we find the same things in the books of wisdom. So for example, next slide please, Proverbs 14, 31. Whoever oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker, but whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord and he will reward them for what they have done. Do you notice what God is doing here? God is placing himself on the side of the poor. God is saying, what you do to the poor, you do to me. If you oppress the poor, you are showing contempt to God. And also we find the same thing in the words of the prophets in the Old Testament. So what God wants is mercy, mercy and justice, not empty religiosity, not just doing religious rituals for the sake of doing religious rituals. That is not the God that we serve. That is not what he wants. In fact, God says our religion doesn't count very much if we're not caring for the poor. So for example, in Isaiah, next slide please. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I hide my eyes from you. Even when you offer many prayers, I am not listening. Your hands are full of blood. Wash and make yourself clean. Take your evil deeds out of my sight. Stop doing wrong. Learn to do right. Seek justice. Defend the oppressed. Take up the cause of the fatherless. Plead the case of the widow. Do you see what God's saying there? To the people who are just doing religious things for the sake of religious things, thinking that that will satisfy God, God says no. True religion is looking after the poor, caring for the widow. So it's no surprise that we find the same instructions in the New Testament. Even Jesus picks up this promise of God's reward for our generosity to the poor. He says many things about taking care of the poor and what we did, what we do to the poor, we do to him. I'll give you one example. Next slide, please. In Luke chapter 12, verse 32. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give it to the poor. Provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out. A treasure in heaven that will never fail, where no thieves come near, no moth, and no moth destroys. God wants his people to be generous to the poor, to look after them. But also we find in the New Testament, this is true especially towards brothers and sisters in Christ, towards other Christians. There is a priority given in the word of God for helping those who are part of God's family. 
So let me give you the, uh, an example in Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Next slide, please. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Thanks, Clara. You can stop screen sharing now. What do we make of it? I think for us here in Australia, we're really blessed, right? We live in a country with really good social security. I didn't grow up in Australia. I grew up in Indonesia where they don't have much social security. In fact, none at all when I was growing up. They're starting to have a little bit of it, but still very different from what we have. The federal government, for example, spends, the, I think, annually around $200 billion. That's around 30% of the federal government budget on social security and welfare, providing for those in our community who are in need. That's all wonderful, but of course we realize that it's still not enough. Lots of people still fall through the cracks. It's not always managed effectively. And sometimes throwing more money in doesn't always provide better solutions. So there's still much work to be done, even in Australia, to help the poor and the disadvantaged in our communities. But with globalization comes also the opportunity to provide for the poor outside of our local context. There are many in our world who are in grave need of financial help all around the world, the poor, the disadvantaged, in developing countries especially. And there are also people who are in need of help because they have been displaced. The, e the UNHCR estimates that there are more than 100 million people. Just kind of imagine that, 100 million people. That's five times the population of Australia around the world who are displaced because of violence and conflict. When you think about the, the issue of poverty in the world, it becomes really overwhelming, doesn't it? Where do you start? Uh, if we know we need to be generous towards them, who do you give to? Now, I have to be honest, I don't have all the answers. Uh, and what I offer today are just a couple of really simple suggestions. But I hope it will only be the beginning of our conversation. Hopefully we can be creative and we can be thinking together as a church, um, as individuals, as friends, group of friends, as life groups, thinking together about how we can respond to this instruction this concern that god has for the poor how can we also do the same thing as individuals as life groups as groups of friends as a church together uh, but let me offer these couple of suggestions when you're thinking about who you should be giving to or how you're going to give to the poor number one be prayerful and do your research so don't just give to the charity that spends the most advertising dollars. And a lot of charities have to do that now because uh, the competition is quite fierce amongst charities, even for the, those charity dollars. Instead, do your research, look at the impact they're making, look at their values and whether their values are fit with biblical values, with your values. And let me just take this opportunity to give you one example. Uh, let me talk to you about the work of Jericho Road. So that's the social services arms of the Presbyterian Church of New South Wales. You would have seen the message if you're part of our church, if you're a regular, if this is your church family, you've seen the message on, on the WhatsApp group about signing a petition for the government to give emergency funding for the Alawa Children's Hospital. Now the Alawa Children's Hospital cares for like 120 kids uh, with special needs. They're one of the very few places where these children uh, with special needs can be cared for. Now, they need some extra funding to recover from the setbacks because of COVID. So let me encourage you, sign that petition. But also let me encourage you, when you sign the petition, it'll take you to their website uh, to also consider maybe supporting the hospital financially. So please do that. That's one of the things that you can do. I'm sure there'll be plenty of other charities that will also fit the bill. Uh, be prayerful, uh, do your research, and, and give generously. Uh, here's a second suggestion. Support something local, or maybe even start up something else local. Uh, let me give you an example. There's this lady in Botany, where I live, that runs a pantry. It's basically just a cupboard 
on Body Road, on the side of the road. Uh, and people can drop off things, they can give what they can, um, grocery items, essential items. And anyone from the community who are in need, they can just take uh, whatever they need. So the tagline is, give what you can and take what you need. It's a simple and wonderful initiative that's been so helpful for many people in the local community. So support that. If there's something local in your area, support that. Maybe even get involved. Um, or we as a church can be thinking together about how we can come up with our own initiative to care for the poor and those around us. Um, support something local, do your research, and be prayerful. I'll tell you what I do, I try to do something local, and we also support, um, we sponsor kids through Compassion. We used to do it through World Vision, but we've moved it to Compassion because we feel like even though World Vision is great, Compassion does their um, charity through churches. And I thought that was a, just a wonderful way of doing things. And um, we support a couple of kids through Compassion. And that's something that you guys may, may be doing too. And maybe there are other ways. Be prayerful start the conversation keep talking about it because this seems to be really important to god now the second group of people we need to support are gospel workers that are, that is people who've been set aside to do the work of preaching teaching and proclaiming god's word so let me read to you a couple more passages clara if you don't mind going to the next slide and sharing the screen i'm going to read from 1 timothy chapter 5 starting from verse 17. The elders who direct the affairs of the church, well, are worthy of double honor, especially those whose work is preaching and teaching. For scripture says, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain and the worker deserves his wages. You see that Paul's talking about a particular group of people whose job, whose work it is, is preaching and teaching. And he brings this up again in 1 Corinthians. So in his letter to the, the Corinthian church, uh, even when Paul was explaining how he's not taking any financial support from the Corinthians church, he's saying that's the exception and not the norm. And so he spoke about supporting gospel workers here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. So the next slide, please. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense, who plants a vineyard and does not eat its grapes, who tends a flock and does not drink the milk? Do I say this merely on human authority? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is trading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? God's not talking about oxen there. Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this is written for us because whoever plows and treasures should be able to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? See, these passages, thank you, Clara, you can switch off the share screen now. These passages tell us the need to support and provide for those whose work is teaching and preaching the gospel, especially those who are doing this work amongst us. And you all do this week in and week out, and I'm very grateful for your generosity uh, because your giving to the church supports me allows me to focus my time and energy to gospel work. And I, I pray that you continue to do so as an overflow of the grace of God that is continually working in you. But of course, your generosity or our generosity to gospel workers shouldn't be limited to our own church. Uh, we should extend it to those people who are ministering, whose ministry uh, is to people who aren't necessarily able to support them. So people like missionaries in different parts of the world, world that are gospel poor. They are preaching the gospel to non-Christians who won't be supporting them, obviously, so they need our support as well. Or gospel workers in universities, because students don't really have much income to be able to support gospel workers amongst them. So it's up to the generosity of other Christians. So that's the two groups of people. Those are the two groups of people supporting the poor, providing for them, caring for them, and also gospel workers so that the work of the gospel can go out. Now, I realize we haven't looked at the passage yet. Uh, so this is the second part of my talk today. And the passage that we're looking at today, this, the focus of this, chap this verses, 
is about how the gift is administered. And here, Paul talks about the importance, how important it is to manage this gift well. And I think our focus, our key, is verse 20 and 21. Hopefully you've got your Bibles open. I'm not going to show it to you because that's a passage we just read. Uh, verses 20 to 21 is our key verse here. 2 Corinthians 8 verse 20. We want to avoid any criticism in the way uh, we administer this liberal gift. For we are taking pains to do what is right, not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. Right? It's not enough to say God knows that we are honest. Uh, to Paul, he also wants to be transparent to others as well. He wants accountability, and accountability is really important. And here in this passage, we see how he's done it. And the way he's done it is he's, he has sent three people to, to Corinth to prepare for the collection. And a couple of things can be said about these three people. Uh, number one, the character is really important. If you look at the passage, the character of these people is really important. The people who manages the collection must be people of good reputation, and they are people who are acceptable uh, to others, who have been accepted by others. So we have Titus, um, who is known to the church in Corinth because he is the one who's delivered the letter to the church in Corinth previously and um, who stayed with them for a while. Uh, so in chapter 8, verse 16, Thanks be to God who put in the heart of Titus the same concern I have for you. For Titus not only welcome our appeal, but he's coming to you with much enthusiasm and on his own initiative. And then there's this unnamed brother who in verse 18, we are told, um, is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. And that's going to be really important. He is praised by all the churches for his service to the gospel. And then there's another unnamed brother in verse 22. Uh, in addition, we are sending with them our brother who has often proved to us in many ways that he is zealous. Right? And in this context, it's zealous for the work of God. So their character is important. They've proven themselves to be reliable and they, they are zealous for the Lord. They are zealous for the work of the gospel. And secondly... Um, from this passage, we find that these people, apart from Titus, who, um, who is kind of like Paul's messenger, these two brothers were appointed or chosen by the churches, and so accountable to them. So in verse 19, when it talks about this, the second brother as someone chosen by the churches, and verse 23, it says this, these two brothers were representatives of the churches. So I think we can all agree how important accountability is when it comes to managing funds collected by the church. Uh, because ministers and church leaders are not immune to the temptation of greed and money. Uh, particularly in religion. Um, I don't know whether you know the founder of Scientology. Uh, his name is L. Ron Hubbard. Uh, he founded Scientology. He created this religion. He, he once said, uh, famously said, you don't get rich by writing science fiction. And he was a science fiction writer. He wrote books on science fiction. He wrote science fiction books. He said, you don't get rich writing science fictions. You, if you really want to get rich, start a religion. And he did get rich by starting a religion. He didn't make much money as a science fiction writer. He made a lot of money uh, from this religion that he created. Uh, even in Christian circles, you'd hear of ministers or church leaders misappropriating church funds. Just recently in Sydney, it's all over the news, a priest uh, being sued or reported to the police by his own church members for using church funds to enlarge his investment property portfolio. So this priest has become a developer in a sense. Or uh, from overseas, a well-known minister who was recently just jailed for using church money to fund his wife's singing career. Or you'd hear it again and again about ministers who are mega rich and who's, who owns their private planes to go on holiday to. And in all of these cases, it's always the same story. You, you, you find the same thing. It's, there's always a lack of accountability. And even when there seem to be transparency or accountability, in fact, it's the people managing the funds are an inner circle handpicked by the minister to manage the funds. So it's everything is hidden from view from the public. Rather than that, what we see here in this passage is Paul describing people appointed by the church who are trusted, who are accountable to the church. All of this 
is good practice of transparency and accountability. Uh, that's why in the Presbyterian Church that we're a part of, you, as members of the church, you nominate and elect the members of the committee of management. I don't, I don't get to do that. You guys do that. That's why our financial books are audited every year by an outside party and published for the congregation to see and review. That's why um, even the minister's stipend is determined by a committee of the denomination and they follow set rules like the basic stipend of a minister, I'm reading the rule here, in any year shall be 65% of the average weekly ordinary time earnings for adult males in full-time employment in New South Wales as published by the Australian Bureau of Statistics in August of the preceding year. All of this is managed and have kind of like very similar patterns, even the allowances have very similar patterns. We follow an objective rule to make sure that gospel workers in the Presbyterian Church are cared for without overly burdening the church. Accountability is important to us, and rightly so, because the Bible instructs us to be. Now, this sermon isn't just about telling you how well our church is being in accountability or being transparent. I've actually got some points of application. Okay, so something for you to think about. If you are in church leadership, if you are a member of the committee management, then you should really take this example from Paul to heart. Uh, you've been entrusted by the church with an important responsibility to manage the temporal affairs of the church, and you should work at doing that well. Uh, that includes making sure the church's funds are being managed properly, and not only in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of man. So pay attention to the finances, double check them. It's your responsibility to do that. You are accountable for doing that job. But also number two, I think there's a lesson here if you're in leadership, if, if you have any hand in managing the funds of the church, is that you should be someone like Titus or these unnamed brothers who has concern for God's people. They're, they're not just picked because they are really good at collecting money or they're really good at counting money. They are picked because they are people who have been reliable and who are zealous for the Lord and the work of the gospel. If you are in leadership, you need to remember that our core business is making disciples of Jesus. Now, from time to time, you have to figure out what color to paint the wall or things like that, but that's not our core business. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus. So be people who are zealous for the gospel. Now, most of us are not in church leadership. Uh, many of you are not members of the committee of management, but you too have a very big responsibility. So that means Pray for your leaders. Pray for the people you have entrusted to manage the temporal affairs of the church. Keep them accountable by attend the annual congregational meeting. I know it's such a chore to go there and you, you, you look at the church budget and things like that, but it's really important because it's part of your role to keep these people accountable. Read the report, be interested in how church funds are being administered. And also, when it's time to do it, nominate and elect godly, trustworthy, and competent people who are zealous for the gospel. Please remember that this is your church family. We're in this together, so you have a responsibility to make sure that when it comes to church finances, we are all above board, not just in the eyes of the Lord, but also in the eyes of men. Lastly, if you're being generous to gospel work outside of our own church, if you're giving to gospel workers in university or if you're supporting missionaries, make sure that the people and organizations you are giving to also have good transparency and accountability in place. Ask good questions. Make sure that is the case. Look, let me finish with this. I know I've gone through a lot on administrative stuff and how important it is for us to be accountable um, how important it is for us to be transparent. But let me finish with it. See, the goal of this is we want to be transparent, we want to be accountable, because the, the money is collected is, is God's, really, and it is used for, it needs to be used for its intended purpose. So, for example, what the Corinthians are doing, collecting money, it needs to be used to help the church in Judea. It's the same way for us today. When we collect money for the work of the gospel here in Kingsway or IPC and to support other ministries around the world, 
it needs to be used to provide for gospel workers so that the gospel can go out so we can do the work of the gospel so that we can share gospel the gospel with more more and more people and god is doing that through your generosity remember when i asked you about when i talked to you about a credit card statement and how revealing it can be now we can't look at god's credit card statement but i think what we can do is look at his word and it will tell us what his priorities are it will tell us what is important to him right if we can look at god's credit card statement i think it will be filled with things like this giving to the poor and giving to gospel work he's told us in his word that this is his priority see we're not giving to the poor just to do some virtue signaling or um, or anything like that we we do that because god is changing our hearts transforming us so that we become concerned for the things that he is concerned about we're becoming like jesus we we our priorities is starting to align with god's priorities and he's already told us what his priorities are his priorities are look after the poor the gospel of god in all of the world and as we are transforming every day as we are being changed every day i think the way we spend our money will follow suit we can follow the money trail here it will lead to the things that god loves as well that god wants to happen so let me encourage you as you are transformed by god's word that your heart will be open to the poor in our local community in our world many of you have started working recently or about to go into the workforce suddenly you have so much money you have you don't know what to do with it be changed by god's word and you will know what to do with your money and i pray that as god changes you your concern for the poor and your concern for the gospel to god into the world will be more and more and more let's pray for that in now let's pray together Jesus heavenly father we thank you that in your kindness and generosity to us you are changing us you are molding us so please continue to help us continue to break down the barriers of greed of our anxiety for the things of this world of our comfort and know that you are a god who is looking out for us who is caring for us help us love the poor as you do to want to care for them to want to contribute to help them because what we do to them we do unto you as well and help us to be concerned for the gospel so that more and more people would know who Jesus is who would bow down to him and worship him as king and savior and understand his love for us the greatest thing that has ever happened to us help us lord not just be generous in our words but be generous with our money as well that you've given us we give you praise in Jesus name amen